In Ayodhya, the palace seemed a paradise on earth. Contentment reigned supreme everywhere. In the evening of life, King Dasaratha found everything to his heart's satisfaction. All the four sons were blooming in excellence. The newly betrothed daughters-in-law were delightfully getting absorbed in the royal family. The queen mothers were beside themselves with joy over the even tenor of life. It was hoped that this symphony would be maintained all through. Soon after the bridal party returned to Ayodhya from Mithila, an agreeable request came to Dasaratha from his aged father-in-law, the king of Kekaya. The person who came on this commission was none other than the ruling prince Yuddhajit, the brother-in-law of Dasaratha, the brother of the third queen, Kaikai. And the simple request was that Bharata, the grandson, be sent over to Kekaya in order to give delight to the grandfather. Dasaratha agreed to fulfill the desire of his father-in-law, so he asked Bharata and his constant companion Shatrugna to go and stay at Kekaya for some time. Prince Rama was making all-round progress at Ayodhya. He was growing rapidly in virtues, verging on divinity. His physique was classic and fascinating. It beamed with brightness and vigor. At the same time, he was simple and free from conceit. Contentment was characteristic of him. He would not use offensive words. He gave sweet reply to annoying interrogation. A trifling good turn done to him was always remembered. Any amount of bad turns done to him were immediately forgotten. Rama was respectful to the elders. He delighted in dialogues with the learned and the wise. His utterances were always agreeable, pertinent and pleasing. No false statement, no purposeless blabbing would ever emanate from his mouth. He was precise and irrefutable in debate. He had an unfailing memory. Rama was ever free from anger. He would refrain from actions and utterances harmful to others. He was resourceful in problematic situations, untiring in the discharge of duty, sagacious in the acquisition of wealth and spontaneous in adding to the joy of people. Sloth and vagary found no place in the makeup of this prince. He was ever alert and watchful. He was too discreet to be deluded. In issues public as well as private, he could with ease discern between merits and demerits. The core of a man's worth was ever open to his gaze. He knew whom to take into confidence and from whom to keep aloof. There was no trace of selfishness in Rama. He lived for others. He was beneficent to the poor. He supported the adorable custodians of culture. The distress received remedial measures from him. He gave protection to all beings. Purity of purpose marked him for its own. He was the embodiment of righteousness. Time was always profitably spent by him. Every moment was a moment of opportunity to him. Verily, he was the incomparable on earth. The wisdom of a father in bringing up the son consists in doing the right thing promptly in time. As the son comes of age, he ought to be entrusted both with power and property. The youth's dormant talents are thereby drawn out. Opportunity induces him come out in exuberance. King Dasaratha knew of this law of life and wanted to give effect to it. On his part, he was waning in vigor due to age, while Rama was waxing in vitality due to adolescence. The right course therefore opened to the father was to crown the son the heir apparent or the Yuvaraja. But it being a public issue, he could not decide it all by himself. He first broached the matter to Vashishtha and Vamadeva. Receiving their approval, he called a council of the wise men, the nobles and the representatives of the commoners and invited their views. Though they were all instinctively drawn to Sri Rama the peerless, they studied the state affair independently on its own merit and arrived at the unanimous opinion that Rama should be forthwith installed the crown prince. Now Dasaratha had a premonition that death was knocking at his door. So he wanted to have this ceremony gone through as quickly as possible. The third day from then was auspicious. So it was fixed and announced. There was no time to invite even the close ones such as the monarch of Mithila, the king of Kekaya and Bharata, the second prince. It did not matter because of the apprehension and urgency. The city was jubilant with a hurried preparation for Rama's coronation on the morrow. Joy was writ on every face. Singing and dancing were going on here and there. Decoration of the capital was in full swing. 
The king sent for the prince and had it put to him that he was to be crowned the Yuvaraja on the following day. A great duty was falling on his shoulders. While the city was feasting and making merry over the coming event, both Rama and Sita were to fast and pray. They had to practice increased humility. Sense control was to be a permanent factor in them. Self-discipline was the mark of the model ruler. Subordinating personal concern to public interest was to be their motto. Rama received this injunction with reverence, touched the feet of the father with obedience and hastened back to his palace to carry out orders. In the meanwhile, a plot was hatching in the very palace which was expected to be full of mirth and joy. A humpbacked old woman, Mantra by name, a maid servant of Queen Kaikeyi, inquired what was the unusual fuss about in the city. She was informed that Rama was to be enthroned as ruler the next day. The alarmed woman hurried with a stern face to the chamber of her queen and queried her. My dear madam, do you know that Rama is to be installed the ruler tomorrow? Kaikeyi said, I am delighted to receive this happy news. Here, take this ornament as a prize for being the first conveyor of it to me. It befits Rama, my darling, to become the Yuvaraja. Mantra throws away the award with disdain and upbraids. Born of a king, be wedded to a king, though you be. Like a baby, you are bereft of kingly interviews. You are innocent of the fluctuating royal tides. Today you are loved best by the king. Therefore, you are held the foremost among the queens. Tomorrow, Rama assumes power. Automatically, his mother Kausalya will come into prominence. You will be obliged to play second fiddle to her. And that will be your misfortune. Today, Rama and Bharata enjoy the same status as the princess. Tomorrow, when Rama becomes a ruler, Bharata will become a subject. And that will be his ill luck. You are unwittingly paving the way for your own downfall and that of your son. And how shall I be a mute witness to it? I shall oppose it for all that I am worth. Kaikei thought and said, How strange! The world views the happening in one way and Mantra in quite another way. Rama is the beloved of the populace. He is adored by the enlightened. He is the pursuer of the path of righteousness. He is wedded to truthfulness. He is the embodiment of purity. He is the eldest son of the king. As such, he is entitled to become the crown prince. Rama loves me more than he loves his mother. Rama serves me more than he serves his mother. Therefore, my status will not suffer from any setback in his region. Rama loves all his brothers as part and parcel of himself. Bharata will therefore face no handicap in his elder brother's reign. Long, long, hence Bharata also will one day succeed Rama to the ancestral throne. O Mantra, cast off your wild conjecture and join us in the jubilee. Mantra became more depressed than before and bewailed. Rama's son only will be Rama's successor and never his brother. All princes becoming rulers leads to anarchy. A shrewd sovereign sees to it that no brother on par with himself in administration is kept anywhere nearby. On one plea or another, he would be kept far off. Now Bharata happens to be away with his grandfather, so there is nobody here to think of him. All attention and praise is on Rama. After he ascends the throne, he will manage to banish Bharata, who alone is equal to him in excellence. You must have the forethought to avert that danger. A day delayed and it will be too late. Again, O Queen, bear another point in mind. Because of your exclusive prominence in the sight of the king, you had on many occasions slighted Kausalya, the first queen. That grudge against you is deep-rooted in her. When Rama comes to power, she will know how to avenge herself. You will be then driven into servility. Redress then would be out of the question. My darling queen, from your babyhood, I have been nurturing you. I have no other interest in life than your welfare. For aught or not, the decision is to be taken today. Here is the solution. Long ago, you nursed your king husband to life when he fainted with a deep wound in a war of gods against the demons. Being pleased with your invaluable service, your Lord offered you two boons. But you did not avail yourself of them then. Now the opportunity has come. 
resort forthwith to the anger chamber and feign desolation. The fawn king is bound to pledge anything to redress your sorrow. Take the promise first from him that he would be true to his word. Remind him of the two boons that remain unasked for. On his agreeing to grant them, demand is the first boon. The Rama should go just now in exile into forest for 14 years. As a second boon, Bharata has to be installed on the throne utilizing the very articles procured for Rama's coronation. Kaikeyi got now completely converted by the crafty hag. She admired the wisdom, farsightedness and statecraft enshrined in that seemingly ugly creature. She agreed to play into the hands of Mantra. She thought she was silly all along but had now become sensible. She acted exactly as was directed by that evil genius. Now the king Dasaratha had completed the arrangements for Rama's installation as Yuvaraja. He thought it proper personally to convey this happy tiding to Kaikeyi, his best loved queen. But as he directed his course towards her apartments, the sentinel informed him that the queen had resorted to her private room. With concern on the face, the king hastened his steps to that room only to find his fond spouse drowned in despondency, fallen flat on the floor, tresses disheveled, ornaments scattered and dress dirtied. The king said, Darling, I do not know the cause of your distress. Have you been slighted by anybody? If you are ailing, the physicians are at your disposal. If anybody is to be honored or punished, take it for granted, it is already done. I will not act against your wish, even to save my life. I swear upon the merits I have all along required that your grievances would be set right. Kaikei said, I do not ail. None has wronged me. I have a desire. You alone can fulfill it. If the grant of it be assured, I shall ask for it. With a sweet smile, the sovereign caressed her on the head and said, You know that among women, you are the foremost to me. Even as among men, Rama is the foremost. Rama is invincible, the best among men, the best of my progeny. He is my life. If I part with him, I will perish. Upon that Rama, I swear unto you that whatever you ask for will be conceded. Kaikei gathers up the newly instilled evil ideas and presents them emphatically. You have sworn you would carry out my demand. Let the Celestials, Terrestrials and the beings of either region bear witness to your commitment. I remind you of the two boons you offered me when I nursed you back to life from the stupefaction caused to you in the terrible warfare between the Devas and the Demons. You are bound to bestow them on me. The first request is that Bharata be enthroned utilizing the very articles gathered for Rama's installation. The second request is that Rama clad in bark should retire into the forest this very day and live there in austerity for 14 years. The demand came like a bolt from the blue. Dasaratha was dazed. It took him some time to recover. He regretted for the fatal promise that he had made. Then he broke out into wrathful censure. You, the despicable creature, you, the embodiment of sin, you, the destroyer of this family, what harm has Rama or I done to you? Rama is always more devoted and serviceable to you than to his own mother. Still you have chosen to hurt him. I have fostered in this mansion a venomous snake in you. What charge shall I bring against my beloved son Rama who is adored universally by all? I may renounce Kausalya, Sumitra, the kingly wealth and my life even. But I will not abandon my son. The world may get on without the sun. Cultivation may go on without water. But my life will not linger in the body without Rama. Oh, the designer of destruction, deign to desist from this devilish design. I implore you, placing my head on your feet. Dasaratha trembled before Kaikeyi, even as a deer would, facing a tigress. The emperor's enraged emotion expressed itself in various forms. He would swoon and sink to the ground, regain consciousness and cajole her. Overwhelmed with grief, he would faint and fall flat on the floor. Abandoning the royal dignity and regal respect, the old monarch wept bitterly at the feet of his obstinate wife. All night passed in begging, 
imploring, wrathful upbraiding, earnest entreaties and woeful crying. But they were of no avail against her iron will. The willful woman stuck to her demand of the fulfillment of the promise. The sorrow-laden night wore away. At dawn, Sumantra the charioteer brought the message from Vashishta that all was ready for the coronation. But the poor king could not speak. Queen Kaikeyi ordered Sumantra to bring Rama there. Hesitatingly, the charioteer looked at the king. In a feeble voice, the monarch mumbled, I want to see my dear Rama. Please bring him here. Sumantra suspected something serious had happened. With concern written large on his face, he drove the chariot to Rama's palace. The festival preparations were complete there. Father and Mother Kaikeyi want you to go to their apartment, was a brief summon. Leaving the bedecked Sita behind in the palace, Rama and Lakshmana drove in haste to the main palace. The rejoicing crowds all along the road cheered Rama lustily. The son appeared before the father and bowed in reverence. Rama! groaned the king and could not speak further. This scene shocked the son. He feared if he had in any way offended the father. With the same reverence, he bowed before the mother and looked at her face inquiringly. The usual motherly affection was now wanting in her. With a feeling of estrangement, she presented the position thus. Your father is bound on oath and by dharma to fulfill two promises solemnly given to me. And you are involved in one of the promises. The king, devoted to duty and to truth, feels hesitant to put you between the horns of the dilemma. Rama responded, Is this all, mother? There is no problem in life to the one strong and will and free from base desire. I am ever obedient to the parents. At their behest, I will jump into the blazing fire, consume poison or plunge into the ocean. Mother, you command me and I am here to obey you. Kaikei said, These two are my demands from your father. In the ascetic's attire, you are to quit the city today and go into the forest of Dandaka for 14 years and practice austerity. Bharata shall rule the kingdom until you return. This is my mandate. Dasaratha trembled at this peremptory dictate of the wayward wife. But the illustrious son sought to obey the command with a celestial calmness and ethereal bliss beaming on the face. Please permit my delay here, just until I take leave of my mother and my maid Sita, pleaded the banished prince. When he moved homeward, people who thronged on the road saw no change on his face, though the face of the accompanying Lakshmana indicated sorrow. Mother Kausalya had just finished her morning worship when Rama made his appearance before her. The pleasure of meeting the son changed in no time into a pang when he briefly presented to the mother the mandate for his retreat into the forest. The mother's position in the family was in no way enviable. King Dasaratha's extraordinary attachment to the Queen Kaikeyi resulted in his unintentional indifference to Kausalya, the first queen. Still, the magnanimous queen did not mind it. But her reaction to Rama's banishment became revealed in a plea. She said, Rama, my darling, life was meaningful to me because of you. I would feel forlorn in your absence. If you should go away from here, please permit me to move behind in the wont of the cow after the calf. The sagacious Lakshmana took the hint. He noticed he was not the only member of the family who opposed the exile of Rama. So he fled up. Brother, you are now the virtual king of the country. Father has outlived this period. People en bloc are anxious to enthrone you. Please permit me. I shall fight against and dispatch to the other world all those who dare dispute your rights. Rama said, Lakshmana, anger is the enemy of man. Enragement has clouded your discrimination. Son is he who stakes us everything to parents. He has nothing to claim from them. Now turning to the mother, Rama says, Satyam shall not be slighted. I am to make father man of word. 
Therefore, I retire into the forest to redeem him from commitment. Nothing can force me deviate from this decision. Father feels pain to part with me. Mother, your presence here, therefore, will alleviate his agony. You will please serve him in his old age. I should not delay further. Please permit me to go. Kausalya said, Darling Rama, do as you have decided. May you fare well wherever you be. Next came to Rama the task of trying to snatch himself away from Sita. She was anxiously awaiting his return so that he might escort her to the coronation hall. He came with a concealed heavy heart. The shrewd Sita detected it and sank down with sorrow. The would-be princess apparent poured forth searching questions. Where is the white umbrella? Where are the singers? Where are the holy chanters? Where are the royal pomp and pageant? The stern answer of Rama was, O Sita of stout heart, my father has exiled me to the forest in response to Kaike's claim of two promised boons. Bharata is to rule and I am to be in retreat. You live in peace in the palace and serve the parents-in-law. You must respect Bharata as the king. Sita could not reconcile herself with the idea of being separated from Rama. Of all relatives, the wife alone shared the fate of her husband. Sita pleaded she had not done anything wrong to deserve abandonment. In penury as well as in palace, she was to live with her husband. She was not afraid of forest life, but if left behind by the husband, she would put an end to her life. Rama was compelled to yield, so he bade her distribute her possessions among the poor and get ready to depart. It was then left to Lakshmana to press his case. He pleaded with Rama that he should also be permitted to accompany him to the woods. Firstly, it was impossible for him to severe connection with Rama. Wherever the one was, inevitably the other also was there. Secondly, he was to devotedly serve the brother and his wife, to guard them day and night and to procure for them forest food such as fruits and edible roots. Rama, however, was obliged to point out the younger one another problem that bristled with difficulties. Bharata would be busy with statecraft. Mother Kausalya and Sumitra would have none to look after them. They would feel stranded. Lakshmana would therefore do well to stay behind and serve them. But that earnest youngster clarified that issue, stating that Mother Kausalya would rise equal to any situation if at all it developed. Whereas his being by the side of the brother in the wild forest was much more indispensable. Rama approved of this idea and asked the other to distribute the personal belongings among the poor and to procure the celestial weapons that were kept in the custody of the preceptor. The three subsequently set out to bid farewell to the king before commencing the exile. On the street they no more saw the joyous crowds hailing them, but the weeping faces shone here and there. Vivid was the contrast between the serenity of the three faces and the sorrow of the concourse. Rama appeared before the king and bowed from a distance. He said, Lord, we seek your permission to depart. Sita and Lakshmana are accompanying me. They insist on doing so. Pray give us your benedictions and permit us to depart. The king said, Rama, I am bound by the boons I had given to Kaike. But I swear to you, I did not intend this base act of banishing you. Do stay this night here with me. Let my eyes be filled with the divine sight of you. Before the dawn tomorrow, you may leave. Rama replied, The pang of separation does not become joy by postponement. As your devoted son, it is my duty to redeem you of your pledge. So I bid that you just now, as demanded by Mother Kaikei. Please send for Bharata at once and make good the other pledge. I have no desire for throne. Now the king wanted to send a big and well-equipped entourage with Rama to the forest. But the all-renouncing Rama viewed it as covetousness and preferred to go in mendicancy. That was exactly what Kaikei wanted and she provided the two sons with the bark attire, the mark of austerity. She delighted in demanding Rama this way, but he delighted donning himself in the crude garment of the rishis. 
Sumitra, the mother of Lakshmana, was the last member of the royal family from whom the departing trio took leave touching her feet. Her charge to Lakshmana was serene. She said, Lakshmana, in the forest Rama is your father and Sita your mother. Serve them with all devotion. Before mounting the chariot, the exiled son pleaded, Father, please be kind to my mother Kausalya the blameless, bereft of me in her old age. There was a collective cry for the carriage to hold on for a while, but Rama ordered its dashing away from the sorrow-laden scene. As the chariot disappeared in the distance, darkness set in Ayodhya, plunging the populace in grief. Dasaratha was sinking with sorrow. He would not allow Kaikeyi to touch him. He gathered up the failing strength and stated, Kaikeyi, I am no more yours. If Bharata agrees to your evil design and accepts to be enthroned, he should not perform my obsequies. The king could not speak further. As desired by him by gestures, he was taken to Kausalya's apartment. There he lay waiting for his end. Rama's first night of the wandering life was spent on the bank of the river Tamasa. Prayer and meditation in a congenial setting, slumber on grassy bed in the open air, these were highly interesting to them who sought to live austere life. On reaching the bank of the sacred river Ganga, the chariot was directed to be taken back to Ayodhya. But the loyal charioteer Sumantra was sorely afflicted to part with Rama, the gem of the royal family. The forest-bound prince consoled him, wiped his tears and requested him to inform the parents of their cheerful onward march. To Kaikeyi, in particular, Rama sent the message that he was in no wise displeased with her. Before the grief-stricken Sumantra reversed the empty chariot, Guha, the chieftain of the locality, presented himself to Rama and gave him a cordial welcome. He further offered to entertain the banished party as his honoured guest all the 14 years. But in view of his vow, Rama had to politely decline the offer. For the same reason, he denied himself the dainty dishes served befitting the chieftain. Fruits and roots only were accepted in conformity with the code of ascetism. Quick was the friendship created between the host and the guests. A night spent in Guha's domain was eventful because of the holy talk that Lakshmana had with him without a wink of sleep while Rama and Sita were in blissful slumber. After the usual ablutions, the next morning the party was ferried across the Ganga by Guha's able men. While on the river, Sita offered worship to Ganga Devi for their safe return home. On the southern side of the river, the party finds itself for the first time completely bereft of other human beings. This experience was significant to Rama. Man comes all alone into the world and quits it all alone. While in it, he ought to know how to be in society and how in solitude. Rama reviewed the possible developments at Ayodhya and persuaded Lakshmana to return there on the morrow. But the younger one would not budge an inch from the resolve to serve the elder one as directed by his mother Sumitra. To the one who knows the way of living, there is no such thing as fate or misfortune. Rama turns the evil of an exile into the opportunity for self-emulation. His immediate concern in the forest is to contact the holy men. He chooses to go to the hermitage of the sage Bharadvaja, located at the sacred confluence of Ganga and Yamuna. His carving the way to the ashrama is much more enthusiastic and purposeful than was his return to Ayodhya after his marriage. With the spirit of a devoted pilgrim, Rama approached the Bharadvaja ashrama. The sage received him with due honor and regard, for he knew of the divine descent of Rama and of the exploits that remained to be performed by him. The venerable sage, viewed the three as his own children. Brief and significant was their stay at the sanctuary. Directions were given to them in regard to the path to Chitrakuta and the desirability of settling there for spiritual pursuits. Absorbing was the journey from the ashrama to Chitrakuta. Dense forests had to be penetrated through. Lakshmana went first making the way possible through woods and thorny bushes. Sita was in the middle and Rama in the rear. Though hazardous, it was a delightful experience to all the three. Sita, in particular, proved herself an inquisitive student making inquiries about birds, bees, plants and trees never seen before. The variety in flowers and fruits, the luxuriance of nature, 
The woodcraft and the things of this kind alien to towns and cities drew her attention repeatedly. Several were the streams they came across. They forded some and rafted the others. At last they reached the river Mandagini. Yonder was the Chitrakuta Mond answering Bharadwaja's definition. It was delightful to look at. The Sylvian setting beggared description. Elephants and deer were grazing far off. The song of the birds was melodious. It was a place for communing with the beyond. Single-handed Lakshmana erected a neat little hut with mud walls and thatched roof. Here, Rama, Sita and Lakshmana forgot the world and entered in beatitude into the realm spiritual. At Ayodhya, the fawn king Dasaratha still hoped against hope that Rama might yet return to console him. But when the grief-stricken Sumantra returned alone and narrated all that took place, he uttered, Oh, Rama! and breathed his last. There was a fresh wave of weeping and wailing all over the city. Now in the midst of the O, the sage and the priest Vasishta was bent upon the attendant work on hand. He had the remains of the king emerged and preserved in oil until the return of Bharata. A few able horsemen were dispatched post-haste to Kekia to bring back Bharata immediately on the pretext of some urgent state affair. The mishap was not to be divulged to him until he returned. That night, Bharata had an inauspicious dream. When he was troubled over it, the invoice came and demanded on behalf of the Venerable Vasishta his hurried departure to Ayodhya to fulfill a pressing duty. The prince was not given the time to take a leisurely leave of the grandfather and the uncle. The two brothers were actually snatched away from the capital of Kekaya. Bharata and Shatrugna were expert horsemen. As they were speeding back to their own capital, conflicting thoughts were crossing the mind. Why has the call come from the priest and preceptor Vashishta? Is there anything wrong in the palace? But the joy of rejoining the revered father and the beloved brother brushed aside all the other thoughts. As the homecoming brothers entered Ayodhya, they noticed the absence of all lively activities. There was a melancholy lull everywhere. Sadness was written large on the face of all. The brothers entered hurriedly the mother Kaikeyi's apartment and paid homage to her. Bharata spoke. Mother, how is it I do not find the usual august presence of our adored father in this chamber? Kaikeyi said, He has departed to the region where all the embodied go ultimately. Hearing that his father was dead, Bharata fell on the floor and wept like a child. He now understood what the dream foreboded. Kaike said, It ill becomes a king to lie on the ground and grieve for the dead. Stand up and accept the kingdom given to you. The innocent Bharata did not understand the implication. What did father die of? How did he catch illness? It was given to Rama to tend him in his last moments. I could not share that privilege with him. What did father say last? Kaike replied. Ha ah, Rama, he said, unable to bear the separation. Then his heart stopped beating. Where was Rama then? Was there any public duty that drew him away from the aged and ailing father? Kaike replied. Not so. It was the banishment that separated him from his father. My ever adorable brother Rama is in banishment? Did he commit any cruel crime or unpardonable sin deserving such a punishment? Was the ever perfect Rama capable of committing crime? And who banished him? Or was it a self-inflicted punishment as atonement for sin? Kaike said, Never so. Rama is always above blemish. He is ever the embodiment of Dharma. Long ago, your father had on oath promised me two boons as reward for the good turn I did to him on the battlefield. Just a few days back, on the eve of Rama's hurried coronation in your absence, I reminded the king of these two boons. He swore to me on Rama the darling that he would fulfill those two promises. I demanded this kingdom for you, Bharata, as a first boon. I insisted on Rama's exile for 14 years in the forest as a second boon. 
Your father could not execute the second boon because of his old attachment to Rama. So I ordered his exit into the woods in the attire of the mendicants. With pleasure he carried out my orders. Sita and Lakshmana have accompanied him. I have paved the way for your assuming power. Now do with pleasure, become the king and enjoy the empire. Bharata's bitter grief had now got transformed into boiling anger. He bled out. You wayward woman! You have come out in your true colors in the selection of the boons. Greed of power has consumed your common sense. The eldest among the brothers succeeding to the throne is a sacred usage of this ancient family. But you have brought infamy to this house sanctified by tradition. Again, it is unfortunate that you are born as the daughter of the illustrious King Ashwapati of Kekaya. My father made a mistake in choosing you as his dearest queen. Rama loved and served you better than his mother. Treacherous and ungrateful creature that you are, you have meted out mendicancy as a reward to him. You have murdered my father. Death is a capital punishment for this heinous crime. But my venerable brother Rama would not approve of it, so I spare your life. You gloat in the thought that you have earned an empire for me. But here is a pledge that I solemnly make to you. Forthwith, I leave this Ayodhya in search of Rama. Bharata shall not re-enter this Ayodhya as long as it is bereft of Rama's region. Further, Bharata shall be in the attire of the mendicant as long as Rama continues in it. Lastly, O oh despicable demoness, I renounce all relationship with you as son. Bharata then called upon the family priest Vasishta and asked for arrangements for the performance of the funeral rites of the departed father. With a heavy heart and in sorrowful calmness, the two princes raised the dead body from the oil and the drum in which it was preserved. It was conveyed to the funeral pyre and the cremation performed in conformity with usage. Bharata, the undisputed successor to the throne, called a council of the elders, the ministers and the representatives of the populace and discussed the problem created by Kaikeyi. The assembly understood Bharata's frame of mind and decided unanimously to go on deputation headed by the declining prince himself and persuade Rama to return. A representative crowd was to proceed and press the matter cogently. The plan was to crown the ascetic heretic law in the forest itself and make him do a regal return home. The concourse moved accordingly to the hermitage of Rama. Guha, the chieftain of Ganga region, was the first to encounter this unwieldy retinue of Bharata. He viewed the younger brother's movement with askance. But on interrogation, he found him loyal to the core and deeply devoted to Rama. Therefore, liberal hospitality and all-round aid for ferrying across the fully flowing Ganga came forth in abundance from the chieftain fast in friendship with Rama. Bharata then made his way to the Bharatwaja ashrama, had his army encamped at a distance and sought contact with the sage, accompanied as he was by the family preceptor Vashishta. The motive of his movement was briefly presented to the sage and instructions received from him to find out the whereabouts of Rama. The retinue then moved southward in search of the missing monarch. At Chitrakuta, far away from the din of the world, Rama's spiritual life was progressing smoothly and blissfully. While in the course of his daily routine, Lakshmana observed at a distance an army approaching Rama's hermitage. He climbed the branch of a tree and scanned the troop closely. The flag of Ikshwaku was in evidence. The vigilant young man surmised danger. He hastened to the revered elder one and said, Brother, your rival Bharata is invading us to eradicate further trouble. Please permit me. I shall put him and his army to rout before he gains access to you. Rama responded, Lakshmana, do not be rash. If Bharata chooses to serve me here, will you go and reign Ayodhya in his stead? Lakshmana becomes abashed. In copious tears, Bharata and Shatrugna present themselves prostrate before Rama and cry bitterly. Lakshmana sees the brother as he is and becomes more ashamed. After the preliminary exchange of greetings, the sad passing away of the father is presented to the sons in exile. A wave of wailing ensues. It takes some time for them to get reconciled to the inevitable end of the father. The four brothers, followed by Sita, went to the river and offered oblations for the peace and welfare of the departed parent. It behoves dutiful sons to send thoughts of benediction to the departed parents. 
Then Rama speaks to Bharata. Bharata, in royal robe, you are to administer in Ayodhya. Assumption of this ascetic attire does not become the ruler that you are. Beloved brother, you are the legitimate ruler of Ayodhya. As long as you are in the hermit's array, I am also resolved to be likewise. Obeying the parents, I have taken to ascetism. Obeying them, you are to take to royalty. My mother is the cause of our father deviating from the family tradition according to which the eldest alone among the royal brothers is to succeed to the throne. I do not approve of this deviation. Bharata, the son's duty is to implicitly obey the parents and not to question them. But when they transgress the sacred usage, usage can be changed if found expedient. That son stands to gain who simply obeys the parents, even when the parents go apparently wrong. Should a son obey his parents when they order him to plunder somebody's property? No, he should not. All orders to the son should be within the bounds of Dharma. My mother wants me to usurp your kingdom. How shall I obey her? What you say is not correct, Bharata. Progeny and property are the wealth of the parents. They can distribute the property as they like among the sons. The dutiful son does not pick holes in the discretion of the parents. That willy woman did not take into consideration my inexperience and our father's public responsibility. Because of his attachment to her, he remained passive. We should therefore jointly set right this lack of statesmanship and we honor the parents thereby. What you say, my darling brother, is not true. Ascetism is the greatest of all duties. Father has imposed it on me. I am to discharge it to the best of my ability. Worldly people view ascension to throne as an opportunity for enjoyment. But the knowing ones consider it as a public trust. Jabali, a priest that came in the party, now presents his say in the matter. Rama, there is no such thing as a persistency of a personality. He who was Dasaratha has now dissolved into the elements. Carrying out therefore the orders of a non-entity is a mere sentiment not based on truth. Ayodhya is drowned in sorrow because of your absence. Please go back and give them joy. While you live, enjoy the vast empire that is at your disposal. Do not discard the pleasures of life on baseless beliefs. Rama objected to this materialistic outlook of the priest denying truth and dharma. Bharata presented another alternative. To the parents, one son is as dear as another. A duty allotted to one may as well be executed by another by mutual adjustment. On that basis, Bharata volunteered to be in exile for 14 years and persuaded the able and popular king Rama to take up the administration of Ayodhya. But Rama ruled out that proposal on the ground that it was expedient for social and political purposes but not for the practice of truthfulness. Making the father truthful was the criterion. Bharata now turned to the assembled group and complained. My brother shows no pity on me. I shall lie down here and fast unto death. Rama said, Brother Bharata, this is not the way of a hero. May you know the issue and face it with manliness. The entire retinue of Bharata now wailed. We came here in search of you, our protector. When you show no mercy to us, we feel forlorn. Our united appeal absolves you from your father's commitment. Please do return to Ayodhya. Rama said, The ocean may dry up. The Himalayas may become bereft of snow. The sun may lose its luster. But Rama shall not make his father false to promise. In order to make his father truthful, Rama shall be in exile for 14 years. Bharata said, Rama is my God. I shall never sit on his throne. For this reason, I disobey my parents. The priest Vasishta came in. We shall find a solution. Let not Bharata sit on Rama's throne, but let him rule the kingdom as Rama's regent. The parents' pledge also is thereby fulfilled. Bharata accepted. 
Brother, I agree to look after your kingdom as your deputy. Your sandals shall represent you on the throne. According to my pledge to my mother, I shall not enter Ayodhya in your absence. From Nandigram, in the outskirts of Ayodhya, your regime will be carried on to the best of my ability. Rama embraced Bharata and approved of the idea. He gave him a pair of wooden sandals on which he placed his feet as a symbol of royalty. Adored brother, I take a pledge before you. If you fail to return to Ayodhya on the day following the 14 years, you will not see Bharata alive. Uttering your name, I shall consign my body to fire. Rama responded, I promise to return. Further Bharata, I have a request to make of you. You should on no account harbor ill will towards your mother. Bharata is serenely silent. This magnanimity is characteristic of Rama, thinks he to himself. Uttering Rama's name, he returns, reports the developments to the sage Bharadvaja, settles as an ascetic at Nandigram and carries on Rama's administration with the able aid of the ministers.